Welcome to the talk on the art and science of extubation. My name's Lloyd and in this session we'll be covering extubation failure, its causes and consequences, and how we predict and prevent it. I'll also cover reintubation and other complications. Extubation receives much less attention than intubation, which is admittedly technically harder. However, extubation is a high risk period. In anesthesia, the NAP4 study found one third of all adverse events occurred at extubation or in the recovery room, with a mortality rate of 5%. In medical ICU patients, a multi-center study found two thirds of those whose extubation succeeded ultimately went home. On the other hand, most patients who failed extubation died or went to long-term care. Of course, this is partly because sick patients are more likely to die and also tend to fail extubation. Mortality is higher where failure is due to non-airway causes, for example, heart failure, as against airway causes of extubation failure like laryngeal edema. There is also some evidence though that failing extubation actually makes you sicker. Now we can estimate how sick a patient is by organ failure scores. If a patient is accidentally extubated, but immediately reintubated, their organ failure scores go up markedly. This suggests failed extubation may actually cause clinical deterioration. To make extubation as safe as possible, we first assess the risks, optimize the patient and timing, and make backup plans. Firstly, why do patients fail when we take away the breathing tube and ventilator. Some fail because they needed the tube and without it, they can't protect their airway. Airway causes include obstruction due to laryngeal swelling or spasm or bleeding inside or outside the airway. Secretions whose management may be impaired due to vocal cord dysfunction or a poor cough, perhaps due to stroke or drowsiness. Soft tissue collapse in drowsy patients with obstructive sleep apnea is another cause. On the other hand, some can protect their airway but need the ventilator, usually for cardiorespiratory reasons. Also called weaning failure, common causes include cardiac ischemia or failure, respiratory weakness, bronchospasm, atelectasis and pneumonia, and aspiration. Sometimes there'll be more than one cause. For example, airway obstruction may result in negative pressure pulmonary edema and laryngospasm may result from regurgitation and aspiration. So, before extubation, we assess predictors of airway patency and airway reflex integrity and predictors of ventilator weaning. But we also ask, is this particular person likely to fail and why? To decide that, look at why they were initially intubated and ventilated. Maybe they were intubated for respiratory failure. Then that's a common reason for failed extubation. Before extubation, one test we can do is to turn down the ventilator support and see how they go. We can even remove the ventilator entirely and use a T-tube, a so-called spontaneous breathing trial. In awake patients with respiratory failure, this is a very useful test. In fact, if they pass this test and are extubated, two thirds are still extubated two days later. Other predictors in these patients include the rapid shallow breathing index, which is the respiratory rate divided by the tidal volume, and the PaO2 to FiO2 ratio or PF ratio. Contrast this with a neurocritical care patient whose lungs are often fine. They're usually intubated for airway protection because of airway edema after long prone procedures or because of neurodeficits or weakness. The predictors that work in respiratory failure patients don't work well here. In fact, the best predictor is GCS. So when you see long lists of predictors, think about the patient 
and which ones best apply to them. Shared risk factors for both airway and weaning failure in various studies include age, temperature and metabolic disturbances, prolonged ventilation, pregnancy, neuromuscular disease, and rheumatoid arthritis. Specifically, airway factors increasing the risk of failed extubation include accidental extubation, an ineffective cough or high secretion load, and neurological state with decreased consciousness, inability to do tasks, and continuous IV sedation, all increasing risk. However, the most acute question is, will the airway remain patent and protected when we pull the tube? Depending on the risks, we may visualise the airway, remembering that the airway is distorted by the endotracheal tube, or perform a cuff leak test, letting down the cuff and listening for a leak. Consider, is there blood or respiratory secretions in the airway to cause obstruction? This may occur either directly or by stimulating reflex laryngospasm, particularly in at-risk groups such as children. Are there decreased reflexes due to drugs, including neuromuscular blockers? Have underlying conditions or surgical procedures resulted in an airway injury? These may cause pressure or bleeding in or around the airway, cord paresis, or impaired drainage and airway edema. Other causes of airway edema include prolonged anesthesia, particularly in a Trendelenburg or prone position, fluid overload, or anaphylaxis. Has the endotracheal tube itself or other devices caused injury? Are there burns or other conditions causing swelling? If airway edema is expected, we consider the use of steroids early. In high-risk populations, intubated for at least 24 to 48 hours, steroids reduce reintubation when given at least four hours prior. Although, multi-dose regimens starting 12 to 24 hours prior to extubation have better evidence. Steroids are ineffective when given only one hour pre-extubation. If extubation fails, will airway management be difficult? Was mask ventilation or intubation difficult previously and why are those factors causing difficulty still present? Is access for reintubation or surgical airways limited? If so, consider staged extubation, which we'll discuss later. Changing tack from airway causes to weaning failure, relevant risk factors include low PF ratio and anemia, but also chronic conditions such as sleep disordered breathing, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and heart failure. If the patient is PEEP dependent, consider non-invasive ventilation post extubation. Reduced oxygen stores will influence the pace of desaturation if severe airway obstruction occurs and may influence what equipment we want available at extubation. In particular, if your patient is at high risk of needing reintubation, consider prophylactic non-invasive ventilation. These were the reintubation and death rates for some high-risk patients receiving standard care after extubation, and this is the result of prophylactic non-invasive ventilation. The greatest and most durable benefit is probably in hypercapnic patients. For your other patients, consider prophylactic high-flow nasal oxygen. Small studies, like this one, show improvements in desaturation and need for NIV and reintubation with better patient tolerance than a Venturi mask. Now, as great as NIV and high-flow nasal oxygen sounds, I'd like to add a note of caution. If these therapies are used to delay an inevitable reintubation, mortality goes up. So patient selection is key, and if you're going to need to reintubate, it's best to do so early. Up to now, I've focused on the risks of needing reintubation, 
but other morbid events can occur at extubation. Typically, awake extubation, our default in ICU for airway reasons, involves bucking on the tube and a degree of tachycardia, hypertension, and increased intracranial and intraocular pressures. If this poses particular risks, we can attenuate it with medications. In anaesthetic practice, deep extubation, potentially with laryngeal mask insertion, can be a useful technique, although it is not used in ICU. If we've gotten to this stage and medically we'd like to extubate, we also need to be practical. Is our environment suitable for extubation? Are there distractors such as other sick patients in the unit, or does the time of day make extubation unwise? Or does the patient need to stay intubated for surgery or a transport? Finally, ask yourself, would this be made safer for the patient overall by delaying? Take the time to ensure fully reversed neuromuscular blockade and optimize the metabolic state, analgesia, patient position and environment before extubation. Although an FiO2 of 1 may increase atelectasis, I typically use it in all ICU extubations. In an upright posture, insert a bite block if tube biting and resultant negative pressure pulmonary edema is a risk, then minimize stimulation and await regular breathing and wakefulness. To extubate, deflate the cuff and remove the endotracheal tube at the peak of inspiration, which is speculated to help expel secretions. Then immediately suction if required and apply oxygen. Now, unfortunately, we're not very good at predicting extubation failure, with evidence suggesting only about one third of patients who needed reintubation were considered high risk by caregivers. Given vignettes of real cases and asked whether they would extubate, one study found physicians frequently extubated patients who went on to need reintubation. In fact, in that study, flipping a coin would have selected successful extubations more accurately. And a statistical model did much better. However, a certain number of reintubations are to be expected. Choosing criteria for extubation is a matter of balancing the risks of extubation failure against those of prolonging intubation, which include infections, diaphragmatic atrophy and deconditioning, sedative exposure and delirium, and upper and lower airway trauma. This leads to the question, what is the optimal failed extubation rate? We don't currently know as only low quality evidence is available. What we do know is that some people will require reintubation. And if we think that will be difficult, one option is to use a Cook Airway Exchange Catheter or AEC. These are like longer bougies that you can oxygenate through. We'll focus on the 11 French and the 14 French, which are 83 centimeters long and small enough to readily fit inside adult endotracheal tubes. To show how these are practically used, we'll look at the Difficult Airway Society guidelines and also the biggest case series of 354 mostly ICU patients who had known or suspected difficult airways and received airway exchange catheters with the patient height determining catheter size. When inserting an exchange catheter, the tip must be above the carina and never inserted against resistance. Once placed, tape it, record the depth, and label it to avoid confusion with a nasogastric or orogastric tube. Using the wrapper fit connector, attach up an anaesthetic circuit and confirm leak around the exchange catheter. Care should be in HDU. If coughing is a problem, put lignocaine through the catheter, again being sure it is above the carina. These and other similar catheters were well tolerated by most patients in the case series with preserved ability to cough and talk. If reintubation is required over an exchange catheter, 
We start with optimal positioning and pre-oxygenation. Use 100% oxygen and PEEP via a bag valve mask. If that's not possible and exhaled gas can escape, consider one to two liters per minute of oxygen via the catheter, but be sure it's not endobronchial to avoid barotrauma. Use sedating drugs, topical anesthesia or no anesthesia as required. Laryngoscopy aims to see the larynx if possible, improving success rates and reducing the risk of complications such as catching the epiglottis. Lubricate a soft tip tube like a fast track and railroad over the catheter with any bevel facing anteriorly, rotating counterclockwise and downsizing if required. Confirm position with capnography. In the study, railroading was usually successful without severe desaturation if patients needed reintubation when the exchange catheter was still in. By comparison, it was very difficult without the exchange catheters with repeat intubation attempts, esophageal intubations, and surgical airways being required. Deep desaturation with bradycardia was much more common. So, if these catheters make reintubation so much easier, how long should we leave the catheter in for? In Mort's study, they were left in for anywhere from five minutes to 72 hours. No one knows the optimal duration, but consider the airway causes of extubation failure. Periglottic edema may occur immediately or up to eight hours post extubation. Neurological causes of reintubation occur later, so maybe 12 to 24 hours is reasonable. If extubation has previously failed, the study authors suggested leaving it in two to three times as long as the previous extubation duration. Overall though, we're really not 100% sure. A promising variation is the staged extubation set, and we have one of these for you to look at in the equipment session. The approach here is to place a wire enclosed in a white plastic jacket to reduce irritation via the endotracheal tube, then remove the tube. This wire, which is flexible enough to be coiled on the face, remains in situ. If reintubation is required, a staged reintubation catheter is passed over the wire to the desired depth. If indicated, oxygen can be given via the catheter, which has distal side ports. The endotracheal tube is then railroaded over this larger, stiffer catheter. As a newer device, there's only one small case series currently, but hopefully it will offer the benefits of the exchange catheter with better patient tolerance. Other ways to head off trouble after a difficult extubation include keeping the patient fasted, upright and awake, and preventing vomiting and aspiration with antiemetics such as ondansetron. Oxygen should be humidified and the patient cared for in a critical care environment with appropriate monitoring. Experienced staff can help foster a calm environment, avoiding patient anxiety which increases work of breathing. Airway plans should be well communicated and equipment available to implement that plan. Finally, I'd just like to briefly touch on other complications that can occur peri-extubation. As mentioned, laryngospasm is often stimulated by foreign matter in the airway or unnecessary head and neck manipulation peri-extubation, especially in younger patients. In addition to clearing the airway, a combination of PEEP, pressure at the laryngospasm notch between the mandibular condyle and mastoid process, and sometimes small doses of propofol or succimethonium may be required to break the spasm. Negative pressure pulmonary edema occurs due to forceful inspiration against an obstructed airway. If you've relieved someone's airway obstruction but their saturations remain persistently low, consider this possibility, particularly in at-risk groups like young healthy males and patients with bilateral vocal cord paralysis. 
Pink frothy sputum and chest x-ray findings of pulmonary edema are typical. Treatment involves relieving the obstruction and giving oxygen and PEEP. Reintubation may be necessary. There is no good evidence for diuretics or steroids, although diuretics are commonly used. Particularly if there are comorbidities, consider whether an ECG or echo is appropriate to exclude other causes of pulmonary edema. In patients with recurrent failed extubation or post-extubation stridor, consider vocal cord dysfunction. This may be due to nerve injury from surgery or the endotracheal tube cuff. Paradoxical vocal cord motion is a deduction of the vocal cords during inspiration, causing stridor and even near total obstruction. This is likely psychogenic and recommended treatment is oxygen and ventilation, but also mild anxiolysis with benzodiazepines. If suspected, both of these diagnoses can be confirmed by nasendoscopy. A degree of laryngeal edema is almost universal with intubation exceeding four days. It also occurs with causes of impaired fluid drainage, such as prone positioning, or with conditions causing edema elsewhere, such as preeclampsia. Usually presenting early, it causes about 15% of reintubations. It's often clinically recognised as stridor, which doesn't necessarily require intubation. The patient needs to be assessed on their merits. We can reduce the risk of laryngeal edema by using smaller tubes, but this can impair weaning from the ventilator. Steroids work, as discussed earlier. Post-extubation, humidified oxygen is used routinely, as is head-up position. The evidence base for nebulized adrenaline in the post-extubation setting is minimal. It's ineffective in children and there are no trials in adults. If you are going to use it, be vigilant for rebound edema. Heliox is appealing, but again, there is little evidence in this setting. Regardless of the treatment used, careful monitoring is essential. So, in summary, we need to assess both airway and ventilator weaning factors before extubation. Despite our best efforts at selection, we should expect that some of our extubations will fail, but optimise to give them the best chance of success. If reintubation is inevitable, we should do so early. And difficult reintubations can be made much easier with the right plan and equipment.